الحمدللہ والصلاة والسلام على رسول اللہ وعلى آلہ وصحبہ ومن والا Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ We are on the topic the end series and we have reached in speaking about the hereafter about the journey in Jannah this is the final part of this end series we go back now and let's take ourselves on this journey inshallah you've entered Jannah and the first people who enter Jannah are the poor people from the Muhajireen and today we'll explain them a little bit further they have drunken from this wine and what kind of a wine it is today inshallah we'll explain what kind of wine this is you have entered and among the first beings that will welcome you as a surprise are the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the angels of Allah are far beyond the numbers of the humans from the beginning of creation to the end of time even if you added the jinns and the humans together from the beginning of, crea of their creation to the end of time they will not equal the same number of the angels Al Rasul Sallallahu was walking his companions were with him and he said to them Attat is sama wa haqqa laha anta'it the sky has crackled and truly it is understandable why it would crackle ma من موضع شبر أو قدم إلا وهناك ملك ساجد أو راكع لله. There isn't a palm span or a foot span of space in Jannah except that there is an angel there all the time, either bowing or prostrating, remembering their Lord in Jannah in the whole of the sky. And we explained how huge the universe is and how huge the skies are, seven skies on top of each other. So a palm's length or or a foot foot's length. As an angel is there. In another hadith, he said, there is a Bayt al-Ma'mur. Bayt al-Ma'mur is like the Kaaba that we have here on earth. It's directly above it. How? Only Allah knows how it's above it. But it's there. And the angels enter, circumambulate, and exit. He says, every day, 70,000 angels enter it, and they exit, and they never return. So 70,000. How long has this Bayt al-Ma'mur been there? obviously before the creation of this universe way before and 70,000 every day entering and exiting and never return till the end of the world till the end of the universe so it's unimaginable you can't count how many angels there are so these angels they are waiting to see you people the people inshallah of Jannah and there are endless numbers of them as we said there is a hadith which, is, which Ibn Kathir brings to us in the tafsir of this ayah in Surat Al-Ra'd where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an Jannatu adni yadkhulunaha wa man salaha min abaihim wa azwajihim wa dhurriyatihim wal malaikatu yadkhuluna alayhim كل باب سلام عليكم بما صبرتم فنعم عقب الدار which means a garden of Eden they will enter it and whoever of their fathers and spouses and offsprings who are righteous will enter it and there will be angels that will enter upon them from every gate from every direction from every door and they will greet them, congratulating them, saying, Peace be upon you as a result of your patience that you persevered in your former life. Oh, what a beautiful end as a home for you now. What a beautiful reward, they say. So they're congratulating and they're giving you glad tidings. There is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Imam Ahmad recorded that Abdullah ibn Amr Ibn al-As radiyallahu anhuma narrated that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said هل تدرون أول من يدخل الجنة من خلق الله 
Do you know who among Allah's creation will enter paradise first? And the companions replied, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and His Messenger know best. And He said, أول من يدخل الجنة من خلق الله الفقراء المهاجرون الذين تسد بهم الثغور. The first among Allah's creation to enter paradise are the poor immigrants in Allah's cause, with whom the outposts of the land are secured and the various afflictions are warded off. Meaning they can't escape. And when they escape, they're on every border of the land, there are people waiting for them, not letting them. So those are the muhajirun who migrated with the Prophet Sallallahu in the beginning. And all of those who came after them in the same cause, migrated with their religion, with their deen, running away from oppression, only because of their deen. They will not change their deen. So they run away with their deen. And on the outskirts there are people waiting to stop them, to kill them, to, to, to persecute them. And he says the hardships have come to them from everywhere and it's very hard for them to water off. Meaning throughout their lives hardships are there because of their deen afflictions but they are patient with it these are the ones who will first enter the jannah and they exist till the end of time the first of the muhajirin of time the prophet sallallahu then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa yamutu ahaduhum wa hajatuhu fi sadri the likeness of them those muhajirin one of them would die while his need is still in his chest because he was unable to satisfy it himself so they, they died and they had migrated with their deen. And hardships have afflicted them. And they die and their goals have still not been reached. They still, yani they still want to, they haven't reached what they want from this world. In goodness. So they die with afflictions and hardships, but with their deen for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will be the first to enter paradise. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ مَلَائِكَتِهِ At that point, Allah will say, whomever He wills, from among His angels, اُؤْتُوهُمْ فَحَيُّوهُمْ Go to them and welcome them with the salam. And the angels will reply, نَحْنُ سُكَّانُ سَمَائِكِ We are the ones who live in your heavens. وَخِيرَتُكَ مِنْ خَلْقِكِ and we are the best of your creations. Are you commanding us to go to these people to greet them and congratulate them? Obviously the angels at this point, they don't know who they're dealing with here. They don't know who it is. All they know is humans and they know what humans are. The majority of humans shed blood and spread corruption on earth. Remember? That's the majority of humans is what we are. But it is only the sifted ones, the ones who are sifted through, the special ones who are rewarded with this jannah. So the angels don't know who, the, who the, they are talking about here. At that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, فَيَقُولْ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا عِبَادًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا وَتُسَدُّ بِهِمُ الثُّغُورِ وَتُتَّقَى بِهِمُ الْمَكَارِهِ وَيَمُوتُ أَحَدُهُمْ وَحَاجَتُهُ فِي صَدْرِهِ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُ لَهَا قَضَاءً قَالْ فَتَأْتِيهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ فَيَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ Which means, the angels will say, we are the residents of your heaven and the best of your creation. Do you command us to go to them and welcome them with the salam? Allah will say, they are my servants who worshipped me and did not associate anyone or anything with me in worship. With them, the outposts were secured and the afflictions were warded off. One of them would die while his need is still in his chest, unable to satisfy it. So the angels will go to them from every gate of paradise, saying to them, peace be upon you, salamun alaykum, for you persevered in patience. Excellent indeed is the final destination for you. This is the tafsir which Ibn Kathir comes with in relation to that verse. Imagine angels of wing and nur, wings and nur, uli ajniha. Allah SWT says they have wings. Some of them have tens of wings, dozens of wings, hundreds of wings. And they enter with nur, beautiful creations of Allah, full of light. Jannah begins to ignite with their light from everywhere. And with all the nur, all the light that exists in Jannah, the nur of these angels come in and they add extra light. And you think to yourself, what's happening here? What's happening? Some people will think, is this Allah? 
subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously all waiting to see him. But no. The first light is the light of Jannah. The second light is the light of the people who enter Jannah. And the third light is the light of the angels coming. From every gate, they're smiling to you, they're welcoming you. Allah loves you, and so the angels love you. Because Allah says, there are servants of mine whom I love, so love them. They say, servants of yours, you love our Lord, so they begin to love them. You heard the hadith of people who seek knowledge for the sake of Allah. The angels come to surround them. And then when there's no more room, the other angels climb on top of them. When there's no more room, the third piece of angels, they climb on top of them. Until they reach the sky, Rasul said. Because they love this seeker of knowledge of what Allah has brought. The angels climb on top of each other until they reach the sky to look at him. So imagine these same angels now, who Allah has described as he loves them, have come to welcome you. Allahu Akbar. Such a congratulations, isn't it? Forget about all the big, you know, uh, all the great welcoming royalties that they have had, they've heard of in history, in this world. This is the welcoming royalty of all royalties. For you, O servant of Allah who has passed the test. In one hadith, in one narration, which is something similar to the meaning of that the angels speak and socialize with these people of Jannah. And when the people of Jannah, the humans who enter Jannah, they speak to the angels and they speak about past actions and things that had happened to them in this life. The angels they begin to laugh so much. You say, we used to do this and we used to do that. The angels laugh and they will say, we have never laughed until you people came into this Jannah. We've never laughed like this until you came to Jannah. They find our words humorous to them and they enjoy it. So they enjoy your company, insha'Allah. Now you have entered Jannah and you see what you see. You've only seen a tiny portion of what... And we mentioned the hadith last week that the Prophet ﷺ said, which is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abu Hurairah anhu. He says, وَلَقَابُ قَوْسِ أَحَدِكُمْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ a space in Jannah equal to the distance between the middle and the end of a bow will be better than all that upon which the sun has ever risen upon and set. So imagine that. So now you've seen a small portion of Jannah. Every space, the soil of it is of musk. The pebbles of it that you walk on, the insignificant rocks, are pearls and rubies. We mentioned this last week. You walk on them. Everybody walks on them. This is just common rocks, pearls and rubies. Common rocks, pearls and rubies. So imagine what is actually built for you, your own property. What is it built of? If the pearls and rubies, you walk on them. Everybody walks on them. Common things. Nobody desires them in this world because they're pebbles. In Jannah, they're rubies and, and pearls. They're just normal. So imagine what is beyond that. Can you sell them? No, you don't need to sell them. You don't want to sell them. There's no need to sell and buy in Jannah. You only wish. Mm. If they were on earth and you wanted to sell them, of course, there is no price that will you know, suffice. Our Rasul Sallallahu tells us its grass is of zafaran, saffron. Now, it's green. Jannah is green. So what is saffron? Saffron is of different colors. So there are places in Jannah which have saffron grass. And there are places in Jannah green grass. There are places in Jannah of different color grass. Gold, silver. But the general outlook of Jannah is greenery. This means that Jannah is full of life. Full of life. Full of springs. You know when you watch a commercial, right? And they advertise something that soothes you. Like shampoo or a perfume or anything like a massage. They, usually a smart commercial puts the sound of fountains or the sounds of rivers or the sounds of water running, yes? And it's one of the soothing... Um, Remedies that they use in massages these days. Mentally, mental healing, spiritual healing, you know. They, they use water, streams, and it, it actually brings the light to the home when you have that. Now they make portraits, right? Artificial portraits, and they put the sound of running streams in them. Some people have fish, and fish tanks in the, inside of their homes. It brings soothness to the mind. So now this Jannah is full of streams and birds and animals. As you enter, you see the trees, obviously, because the trees are huge. And now you're walking to your palace. Rasul tells us, which is Sahih Hadith, he says, 
every, Wallah, he says, Walladi nafsi bi yadi. By the one who possesses my soul in his hand, in the long hadith. He says, every one of you will know their home in Jannah as they know their home in this world. You've never been to Jannah before, but as soon as you enter it, subhanAllah, there is an intuition inside of you. It's pulling you towards your property. You gotta go somewhere. Where have you gotta go? You gotta go to your property. Because Allah has something in store for you there. This is the first thing that you're gonna see. Your property and your ahl, your spouse, and your servants and whatever is there for you. Allah wants you to see what He has in store for you. But He wants you to see it on your own. So the intuition is in every person individually. Imagine, insha'Allah, Ya Rabb, you and your friend enter Jannah. You're happy, you congratulate one another. Suddenly there is this feeling, this urge inside of each one of you, you need to go somewhere. So then you depart. You forget about your friend. And your friend forgets about you. Well, you know, just for the time being. And then your friend goes. My brother here, Gurkan, goes to his palace, insha'Allah. Uh, and his friend, Ahmed over there, goes to his palace. There's something they're awaiting for. So they head in their own directions. Maybe the angels are with them. Maybe they're flying there. If they wish, they say, oh my Lord, I wish to fly to my property. So they fly and they know the direction. You don't need an escort. And you're awaiting to see your own property specially for you. Your friend doesn't see it, only you go and see it for now. It's because you have to lay your first eyes on there. And maybe the angels are telling you, oh, wait till what is in store for you. Obviously socializing with them, wait till see what is in store for you. You know when you hear someone, oh, there's something waiting for you. It's the first type of you know, wanting to reward you, the first way of, of making you excited. And so you're on your way to the palace. You see gardens, you see rivers, you see all these things that you've never seen before. So let's, for example, take one piece of sightseeing. And they are what you see mostly, the trees. In Jannah, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu tells us about the trees of Jannah in one hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is a tree in Jannah that is so huge that if a rider of a swift horse has to cover its distance from one end to another, he will not be able to do so, even in a hundred years. Narrated by, collected in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith in Arabic, he uses a certain description of this horse. So not only is it a horse, any horse that's galloping, at a very fast pace, he uses the term mudammar. Mudammar is type of horse that he used to refer to in the Arab world. I mean, forget, let alone the Arab stallions, how fast they are, yeah? they use them in horse racing. He says, al mudammar from the Arab stallions, i.e. a specially trained and well looked after horse. Such a horse, brothers and sisters, is first fattened, they're fattened, right? By supplying it with large quantities of food. Then slowly the quantity of food given to it decreases and it is made to sweat in a hot room until it loses weight and thus becomes fit for running. This is how they used to prepare this horse. They build its muscles up and then they work on a cardiac exercise. All that energy is burnt off and they become lean, full of muscle, full of energy, full of cardiac work. Abedin. This is one of the best horses the Arabs used to look after. Most expensive as well. So he's saying he would race as fast as he could. It would take a strong rider a hundred years even, not even a hundred years, would be enough to cross the distance of some of these trees. So some of these trees are like that. Imagine some of them. Not all the trees are like that. Imagine their leaves. Rasul Sallallahu describes their leaves. He said, I saw trees so huge in their trunks. Their leaves are the size of elephant ears, some of them. And they have different colors, different shapes, different forms. Now imagine the colors that we know in this life. All the colors that we have ever encountered. Can you imagine more colors than what we could imagine in this world? No. In Jannah there are more colors than what any mind has ever imagined. Forget about the rainbow. In Jannah, colors beyond our dreams, which no mind in this worldly life can actually reach in Describing. Here is a little story I want to mention to you. Abu Dahdah radiallahu anhu, companion of the Prophet. There was a companion of the Prophet by the name of Abu Dahdah who cultivated his garden next to the property of an orphan. And the orphan 
he claimed that a specific palm tree of Abu Dahdah's land was on his property. And therefore he claimed, the orphan claimed that it belonged to him. So the companion rejected the claim. And the orphan went to the Prophet wasallam to complain about this. And the Messenger wasallam measured, he measured, he ordered for the gardens to be measured. And he found that the palm tree did indeed belong to the companion. It belonged to Abu Dahdah, not to the orphan. And the orphan began, he erupted in crying. He cried and said, no, it's mine. Seeing this, the Prophet wasallam felt compassionate you know, towards the orphan. You know, okay, it's not his, but... He's an orphan boy. And he asked the companion Abu Dahdah, he said, Would you give him the palm tree? And for you is a palm tree in Jannah. However, you know, the companion in his disbelief at what the orphan had done, he didn't really hear the Prophet ﷺ out very well. And he just sort of went away angrily. He said no. And he went away angrily. However, Abu Dahdah, after that, after he had calmed down, he remembered the opportunity the Prophet ﷺ had told him about. He went back to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked, Ya Rasulullah. Actually, I misquoted the hadith a little bit, if you don't mind, if I can just go back a little bit. It wasn't Abu Dahdah initially that owned that, that garden, there was another companion. So it was another companion who owned the garden. And he rejected and walked away angrily. Now Abu Dahdah comes into the picture. Sorry. Abu Dahdah now comes into the picture. And he heard about what the Prophet ﷺ had offered the other companion of a palm tree in Jannah. So Abu Dahdah came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, if I buy the tree from this companion and give it to the orphan, shall I have that tree in Jannah that you told the other companion about? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, yes, you will. So Abu Dahdah anhu chased after the companion and asked him, would you sell that tree to me for my entire garden? I'll give you a whole garden and give me that palm tree. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. And the garden that Abu Dahdah had was full of 600 trees, well cultivated. And the companion answered, take it. For there is no good in a tree that was complained to the Prophet ﷺ about. Yeah, this orphan complained to the Prophet ﷺ, I have no need for it anymore. He complained to him about it, take it. And he gave him in return the garden full of 600 trees. Immediately Abu Dahdah went home and found his wife and children playing in the garden. And he said to them, leave the garden, leave it, get out of it. He shouted, get out of it. We've sold it. And his wife said, who have you sold it to, ya Abu Dahdah? He said, I sold it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She said, we've sold it to Allah. She said, he said, yes, we've sold it to Allah. And she looked at her children. Some of her children had already taken some of the dates. They were eating it. She slapped their hand and snatched it away from them and said, leave it. It's not ours anymore. For your father has sold it to Allah. We have sold it to Allah. When Abu Dahdah was later martyred in the battle of Uhud, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stood over his body. And he said, in front of everybody, how many shady palm trees does Abu Dahdah now have in paradise? How many shaded palm trees does Abu Dahdah have now in paradise? And don't ask me the shape and the color and the beauty of these palm trees. Where are these palm trees? They are, they are planted in the land of Abu Dahdah. So don't ask me how big this land is. What is this land? Is it full of, other, it is full, of, full of other pebbles, full of other buildings? Don't ask me what kind of buildings there are in there. It's full of servants who are cultivating it for him. Don't ask me how many servants there are. So just because of trees, look what Abu Dahdah had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him for it. In one hadith, it tells us that there is a breeze that comes past in Jannah every now and then. And this breeze touches the leaves of these trees. And so they begin to cling together. Or they begin to bang on one, one another, producing beautiful music. Producing beautiful music, music. In Sahih Muslim, there's a hadith about Israfil alayhi salam. The angel Israfil alayhi salam, the blower of the trumpet. It says that Israfil alayhi salam will sing to the people in Jannah with his voice. Don't ask me what kind of singing. 
beautiful melodious singing and the people of Jannah will hear this voice and they will stop all at once and say who is this voice and it will be said it is the angel Israfil alayhi salam Allah had given him the most beautiful voice ever he will sing to the people of Jannah other than Israfil alayhi salam there is another people who will sing for the people of Jannah that will come very soon insha'Allah I will let you know in a short while as you are passing by these trees these beautiful breeze and these dangling fruits there will be animals so you'll notice animals and birds and here is one hadith a humorous one where the Prophet ﷺ was narrating and talking about Jannah in front of his companions and among them was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu now we all know of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he had a very big body right before Islam used to eat a lot and he was full of muscles mashaAllah massive body Umar radiallahu anhu so the Prophet ﷺ was asked about once he was asked about the rivers of Al-Kawthar so he said, it is a river that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me. It is whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. There are some birds that drink from it. And their necks are like the necks of camels. These birds are so huge and well fed from drinking from the fountain of Kawthar. So they are organic, my dear brothers and sisters. And the fruits in there are organic. And everything you eat in there is organic. The beef that you eat from there and the, and, and the animals they eat from there are from the organic sources. The point is in Jannah, there's no ambiguity about what you eat. It's purely from the sources of Jannah, purely organic and of the best. So, Rasul Sallallahu says, they are not, a, you know, he talks about these birds and Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was there in the audience and he said, Subhanallah ya Rasulullah, they must be having a lot of fun. The birds are having a lot of fun eating like that and growing on this. And the Prophet wasallam smiled and he said, the ones who will eat them will have more fun, Ya Umar ibn al-Khattab. So there are people who will eating them, they will have more fun than the birds themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِّمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ And they will have the flesh of birds, any that they may desire. Now you might say to yourself, well I don't like eating bird meat. My brothers and sisters, it's only because of the experience you've had with bird meat here. But when you see the bird meat over there, it's nothing like any bird meat here. You're going to say to yourself, what's this? You know, it's like as if in this world you're eating insects and you say it tastes like chicken. <laughs> in Jannah you're eating these birds, it tastes like something beyond your dreams. So don't assume now you have walked on your way to the palace, you're alone. If you are a man, you are walking to your palace. If you are a woman of Jannah, well, it depends. Allahu A'lam, I'm not sure. Will you be walking to your Jannah or will it be this way? You reach your palace and you find that your palace, I'm getting to you sisters very soon. You find that your palace is beyond your dreams. Allahu Akbar. Bigger and wider than any palaces you've ever seen on earth. There are rooms in there that will take you 30 days just to cross them. Ar Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Labinatum min dhahab wa labinatum min fidda. There are palaces in there. Now we're talking about the lowest people of heaven. That's just the lowest, which is where you start from. Palaces made of bricks of gold and bricks of silver. Now, when you say gold, is it like the gold of this world? No. Silver, is it like the silver of this world? No. Bricks, are they like the bricks of this world? No. I mean, go and visit on the internet, historical architecture. Amazing. Well, in Jannah, there is nothing like it. One of those bricks, just one brick of the bricks of palace, of the palaces of your palaces in Jannah, is better than the whole world and whatever the sun has ever risen upon. The nur, the light that emanates from it, and the musk that is smelt from it, fills the universe the cement rasul sallallahu alaihi said the cement that holds the bricks together is of pure 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 musk what kind of musk this is it's not the liquid musk that you use but obviously it's made of that and so it is the cement so imagine cement that holds the bricks is made of musk al idfir, pure, pure, pure of the purest of musk. Is it like the musk of this world? No. It's just called musk. 
in the hereafter, its smell is beyond your dreams. Now one might ask, if the smell of musk in Jannah fuels the universe, won't you die from the smell? You know, no matter how beautiful it is, it's going to be heavy to the nose, right? I mean, if you put a beautiful perfume on, a nice smelling cologne, right? And you come to meet your wife, she loves it. But imagine putting a kilo on. Your wife will even run away from you. So in Jannah, what's the, what's the point? Well, my dear brothers and sisters, when I explain to you the power and the form that Allah will create you in, in Jannah, you'll understand. Your smelling ability is super, super power. Your seeing ability is super, super power. Your strength is super, super power. And we're going to get to those, inshallah, in a short while. So you enter that Jannah. Otherwise, how can you withstand that light? You can't withstand the light of Jannah. You can't withstand the lights of the, of the angels that you're about to see. And behold, you will not be able to withstand the light which now is on a tower just above your palace. What am I talking about? You reach your palace, you've seen it, you've seen it. It's beautiful, it's glittering. Suddenly you see this light that is shining down and beautiful light that covers your whole entire property. It's not the sun. It's not special light coming from above. You look up into that tower and in that beautiful tower there is your spouse, your wife is waiting for you there. So our sisters who enter Jannah, are you walking to your palace or are you actually escorted to your palace and then you are placed there to wait for your spouse who is about to come and meet you. So in other words, maybe you are there and you are clothed and given the beautiful jewelry. The makeup of Jannah is placed on you. You are prepared for your groom who is about to approach. And you're waiting to see his face and how, he's going to, how you're going to be attract, attractive to him. You know, the nature of men and women. This is the nature of men and women. Women love to beautify themselves to attract their husbands first. Even though the husbands also attract their wives. But... In the first stage, the woman loves to beautify herself as in her nature. So imagine you've entered now and there are servants of yours in your palace. You've beaten your husband there and they've prepared you and put all this makeup on you. In fact, in Jannah, what is makeup? Is it fake up? As we call it in this, I call it fake up. No. What is the makeup in Jannah? You don't need any makeup. The makeup of Jannah is the way Allah has created your face. And now I would like to describe just a little bit of the women of Jannah. The women of Jannah, who en the women who enter Jannah from this world are indescribable. I cannot describe them. The hadith and the ayat in the Quran have not described the women of this world who enter Jannah. But what have they described? They've described the women who are created in Jannah. The Hur al -Ain. As for the descriptions of the women who enter Jannah, they are beyond their beauty. Forget it. They will look like they were just insignificant, uh, you know, just some, a little pearl they wear around their neck. That's all it is, really. So the Hur in Jannah, the women of Jannah. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَلَا, وَلَا, وَلَا نَصِيبُ رَأْسِهَا the, the, the tiara. Ever heard of a tiara? A crown or a tiara of a princess or of a queen? So the crown or a tiara that she wears that she wears on her head. Not even talking about her head. We're talking about the tiara, the crown that she wears on her head. From her beauty. خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا عَلَيْهَا Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. It is better than the whole world and everything that's on it. In another hadith, which is also sahih, he said, if her face were to be shown to the people of the world, there will be a world war over her. There will be a world conflict over this one woman. Forget about all these beauty, pa beauty pageants that are elected and voted for. Forget about all the women that you've ever heard about or seen in this world. They are not even worth, wallahi, an atom's worth of span's length of a hair, of a thread of hair of the women of Jannah. Literally, I'm saying this, really. When you look at it, they're nothing. In another hadith, if she spat in the ocean of this world, how salty is the ocean? If she spat in the ocean of this world, it'll turn it sweet. 
the ocean. It'll turn it sweet. Now again, you might think to yourself, if it's that sweet, how can I bear the sweetness of her in Jannah? Again, your form and shape and your abilities in Jannah are super, super compared to here. They're nothing like here. Rasul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran, Hur Ain. Hur Ain, which is a word used which is familiar to the Arabs of the deserts at that time. These words, Hur Ain, were revealed in the Meccan verses when the people lived in Mecca, the Muslims in Mecca, before they migrated. So he's talking first the people of the desert and the people of Mecca who understand what Hur Ain means. Hur Ain, lustrous eyes, lustrous big eyes. Beautiful, lustrous, big eyes. In another hadith, it talks about black eyes. Pitch black. The iris is pitch black. Now, does this mean that all the women of Jannah have pitch black eyes? No. But talking to the people of Mecca, in the Meccan verses, it's giving an example of what they would desire. So in other words, if the Quran mentions a particular description of colors of the men or women in Jannah, it is giving only an example of what certain people can desire. So if he's talking to the people of Mecca, they desired lust, lustrous big eyes, dark pitch black irises in a woman. So Allah says, for you, you will have that. In other words, if this is what you desire, you're going to get it. If you desire blue eyes, you're going to get it. If you desire green eyes, you're going to get green eyes. If you desire different colored eyes, you'll get them. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَهُمْ مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُهُمْ وَتَلَذُّ أَعْيُنُهُمْ that explains it all. They will have in Jannah everything that their nafs, your temptations, your lusts, your desires inside of you tempt for. Anything the nafs desires for, you can have it. And whatever their eyes, whatever their eyes want to taste. Want to, talad, meaning to taste. Whatever the eye wants to taste. You know, the eye can taste, yeah? Not like the taste of the tongue. The taste of the eyes, Allah SWT says, whatever the eye wants to taste, meaning to look at, they will have it in Jannah. So if your eyes love to taste green eyes, this is what you will have of the best. Loves to taste the look of black pitch eyes, then this is what you will get. So whatever you wish and desire, it is there for you in Jannah. But the most beautiful thing of the women of Jannah is their nur, the light that emanates from them. And they have been clothed with clothing from Jannah, harir, silk of the most finest that you could ever imagine. And their shapes and forms, are, you'll read the Quran and the Hadith, you will see it. I can't talk about it here because we have young, we have young uh, men here who are not married yet. And we have our sisters here, we don't want to offend them. And we have children here who won't understand what we say, even if we say it. Read about them, whatever you want. I narrated the ayah. Uh, recited the ayah you'll have anything your nafs desires and whatever your eye wants to taste that explains it all so in other words whatever your feelings want whatever your eyes want whatever your, your anything it is there so you see your wife in Jannah now there is a question is it your wife that is in this world you will see her again in the hereafter or is it another wife or is it women that Allah has created? Is it the same man that you will get? The answer, my dear brothers and sisters, some of it will shock you. Asma radiallahu anha married a Zubair radiallahu anhu. And she complained to her father Abu Bakr about a Zubair radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Anhum ajma'in. About a Zubair's strictness. Like she, 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 she complained that she's too strict on her. A Zubair radiallahu anhu. He's one of the ten promised paradise. And Abu Bakr anhu said to her, O oh my daughter, please be patient, because a woman, if she has right, a righteous husband, and then he dies, and she does not marry after him, Allah will bring them together in Jannah. <laughs> Here is a woman who is complaining about her husband. In other words, if it's a woman today, they'll say, Oh my God, I'm complaining about him here, and I'm going to be with him for eternity in the hereafter. I'm never going to get married ever. Or I can't wait till he dies so I can marry someone else. Uh, it's not like that. Remember, brothers and sisters, you have to try and understand. When Allah is messenger to speak to us about Jannah and the things in Jannah, you cannot think in the mind of this world. In fact, you cannot understand it. 
What is the reason why a wife or a husband dislike their wife or husband in this world, their spouse? Isn't it because of treatment? Isn't it because of their experience with them? I mean, when you first met them, you love them. You, and then afterwards, you get used to that love. Well, in Jannah, there's nothing that exists like that. All the mistreatments are gone. All the ugliness is gone. All the bad smells are gone. All the, the, you know, the, the ugly desires of a person is gone. There is none of that. Allah says in the Quran, لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا تأثيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما You will never hear in there hurtful words. We will not hear in there offensive words, degrading words, harsh words, annoying words, all of that. Never heard, hear, hear negative words. Except it will be said salam and salama. Every word or sentence that people say is accompanied with a gesture of peace, peace. So whatever you say, you can talk anything you want. But every speech that is said in Jannah, you receive the feeling of peace from it. You know, it doesn't mean necessarily that every time you go, Salamu alaykum, Salamu alaykum, and that's all you say. Qilan salam and salam, all you hear is salam, salam. It doesn't mean that people don't know any other word but salam in Jannah. Imagine that. Salam, salam. No. It means that every sentence, every word, every look, every look, every touch, everything is accompanied with a gesture of salam. You can feel it. So that spouse you have in this world who has struggled and you may not have a pleasant life with him or her in Jannah, if they are righteous, that's the condition, they'll be a totally different form. Imagine the righteous people of this world who enter Jannah. And imagine this as Zubair, one of the ten promised Jannah. He will be among the most beautiful, handsomest, beyond your dream. Eat your heart out, men, in Jannah. And his wife, Asma, who was being patient, she will be among the eat your heart out women in Jannah. So imagine the righteous women of this world and the righteous men. No matter how you may look, no matter how your character is, in Jannah, you'll be of the perfect form. Yeah, and I will say this, maybe if I can say it this way. There was this story of this man who was married to this woman for 60 years. Finally she died. And she gave him misery in this life. When she died, she died a Muslim. At their grave, the Shaykh said, Oh Allah, you know, unite her with her husband in Jannah. The husband looks at him and says to him, Please, Ya Shaykh, 60 years of my life in misery, you want me to live for eternity in misery? Now, if that old man knew, if he knew that his wife was going to enter Jannah, and he went to Jannah and he saw her there. The first one he will desire is her. So this person you see in this world, when you go to Jannah, you say, who is that? Who is that? And they say, this was your spouse in, in, in the world. And you say, I can't believe it. No, no, no. My spouse in that world was, you know, he used to stink. He used to look like this. If he spoke, he didn't say pleasant words. He forgot to buy me gifts. He forgot, you know, about this and never complimented me. In Jannah, he was complimenting me, smiling to me. Oh my God, I want to live with him forever. He can't be my, my spouse that I had in that world. But he is. And so, my dear sisters and brothers, don't think of the, of the mind of this world. A woman came to the Prophet, an old woman, and said, Ya Rasulullah, will I enter Jannah? He looked at her and wanted to be humorous with her. He said to her, mm, no old women will go to Jannah. So she got, she, she got a little bit hurt there. You know. What's this? And when the Prophet ﷺ noticed it, he said to her, you will enter young. You will enter young. Meaning, when you enter Jannah, you will no longer be in old age. And so it brought a smile to her face. Meaning you'll enter it, but you won't be old anymore. In Jannah, the people are at the age of about 30, 33 years old. Prime age. In this world, you may look at 30, 33, they may have a few white hairs, right? You want an 18, 19 year old maybe. A 25 year old. In Jannah, a 33 year old is far more handsomer than a 25 of this world. 33 is the middle age, is the age of Isa alayhi salam. Rasulullah said, the height of our father Adam alayhi salam, 60 cubits or arm lengths tall in the sky, 20 cubits wide approximately on the surah on the shape of Adam alayhi salam our father and obviously people have different nur to other people in Jannah some of them are more handsome some are more beautiful than others but no one will be jealous of the beauty of anyone else you know 
A woman wouldn't sit there and say, oh, look at her, she, th she thinks she is. She thinks she's prettier than me. I'll just go back to my servants back in my palace and you watch what they'll make of me. Or you watch when I go and get my you know, clothing of silk and we'll see what she thinks. She can eat her heart out. No, there's none of that stuff in Jannah. There's no jealousy. She'll say, well, she's so pretty, but I'm also pretty too. Right? Husband comes back and she says to him, you look more beautiful than when I first met you before. He says, yeah, I was in the market. He met other people. And so the nur came onto him a little bit. And he says to her, you look more prettier than I saw you before too. And she says, yeah, well, I guess I am. And this is how it is in Jannah. I'll end it with this. The spouses say to each other in Jannah, the husband says to his wife, he initiates the saying, he will say to her when he first meets her, everything that I have seen so far in Jannah, there is nothing that I have seen that delighted my heart and delighted my eyes more than you, more than what I have seen in you, my wife. And she says to him the same thing. And guess what? She begins to sing for you. And the things they sing for you is نَحْنُ الْخَالِدَاتِ فَلَا نَمُتْنَ We are the ones who will live for eternity and we will never die. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> so they'll sing for you far more better than my voice beyond your imagination. Will you sing for them? If you wish, you may. We'll end it here insha'Allah and next week we'll continue that meeting with your spouse and we'll move on to the preparation for the feast. Yell. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.